Despite these objections, ETP pushed forward with the construction of DAPL. This eventually resulted in massive opposition to the pipeline where an indigenous people from many tribal nations and their allies from across the United States uh, gathered to face off against police and private security personnel who were deploying tear gas, water cannons, dogs, armored vehicles, and other means to ensure that construction of the pipeline was not interrupted. Despite all the opposition, construction uh, of the pipeline was completed and interstate oil delivery via DAPL is reported to have begun in, in June of 2017. The legal and public debate regarding DAPL remains ongoing and tribes together with environmental groups have continued to oppose the pipeline. The action taken by ATP and others invested in DAPL cost those companies a significant amount of time and money. For instance, because of opposition and legal issues, ETP was forced to move beyond the January 1st, 2017 deadline that they had agreed to with shipping partners. A University of Colorado study published in November of 2018 estimates that DAPL cost ETP and other pipeline developers invested in DAPL $7.5 billion, uh, which is almost double the project's initial budget of $3.8 billion. Given DAPL's current legal challenges, that number is growing even higher. The actions taken by ATP throughout the DAPL project have significantly damaged public relations for that project, for ETP, and for the oil and gas industry generally, including reputational damage to financial institutions and others who indirectly support the oil and gas industry. The example of the DAPL project, along with Oak Flats, Moanakia, and other relatively recent high-profile projects that have been met with substantial indigenous opposition, demonstrate the importance of developing effective and meaningful communication with tribes prior to development projects that have the potential to impact areas or landscapes that are important to tribes. The fallout from the DAPL case has both directly and indirectly brought renewed focus to tribal engagement among some in private industry, the federal government, and those working in private environmental and cultural resource consulting. It is within this wider context that I began working with a private environmental and cultural resource management consulting company to complete my th applied thesis research. <clears throat> um, so just a little bit of background on section 106. In 1966, Congress signed the National Historic Preservation Act into law. Uh, regulations now guiding section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act require the federal government to consult with any federally recognized American Indian tribes potentially impacted by federal undertakings. Once impact to historic properties is assessed and adverse effects are determined, federal guidelines uh, require a plan to be created to avoid, minimize, and or mitigate adverse effects in order for federal undertakings to move forward. Um, and then just a little bit of background on my applied thesis uh, client. Uh, I was working as part of an interdisciplinary team uh, conducting an ethnographic study um, for an area and all the specifics of the study have been omitted and including names, uh, specific quotes from tribal representatives, um, everything pretty much uh, has been omitted. And uh, this was a, a private environmental and cultural resource consulting company and um, working with a lot of archaeologists. It wasn't really this type of archaeology uh, that you see. It was more uh, surveys so people walking across the landscape looking for uh, for different things is, is a big part of what they do. Um, and for the particular case study, it was uh, an area where there was a natural gas project, a uranium mine, and, and a pipeline uh, project all in that same area. And through those projects and the review around those projects, the BLM recognized the area as a traditional cultural landscape and began treating it as such and hired uh, the firm that I that I helped with to um, help identify and evaluate traditional cultural properties and uh, do an ethnographic study in collaboration with uh, tribal representatives. So my research questions for my thesis were how might the information derived from the case study inform general strategies that could be implemented to improve engagement, consultation, and collaboration among tribes governments and agencies uh, and environmental and cultural resource consultants and private industry developers. And then my other question was uh, how might information derived from the case study inform general strategies that could be implemented to navigate challenges that arise during tribal engagement 
uh, and the consultation process surrounding traditional cultural properties, as well as in engaging with tribes on land and resource management issues more generally. So these are some of the theoretical perspectives that I utilized and I added this, uh, Howard had recommended that I add this last one shifting times. I think it's uh, the theme of the conference is very relevant to this research and it's kind of uh, this shifting roles of anthropologists and uh, and the work that we do is really woven throughout um, a lot of this research as I think you'll see. So the different lenses that I used to, to look at this issue were traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Um, and uh, <clears throat> I apologize for if any of you guys are, I know a lot of you already know a lot of this stuff, but just setting, setting it all up. So traditional ecological knowledge is um, indigenous knowledge about nature and the natural environment is somehow, it's how it's sometimes uh, defined. That's the short definition. And then indigenous knowledge I see as a bigger category rising out of an indigenous culture. Um, so those were two aspects that I looked at in, re in relation to this research. Um, and then I also looked at sacred ecology, which really looks more specifically at the spiritual uh, aspects of traditional ecological knowledge. Uh, and then political ecology, which is influenced by uh, a previous researcher, Kate Katie Berkelau, that worked on this issue um, and looks at how power and politics affect the environment. Um, and in Katie Berkelau's research, it basically accepts the current political reality and then takes a look at what can be done within that political reality to affect change. Um, and that's mostly what I do in, in my research as well, although I, I do um, go a little bit outside of that. Um, for instance, in political ecology, regarding this issue, kind of looking at how tribes and other actors will challenge and reinforce uh, existing systems through their participation in these systems in the current uh, traditional cultural property consultation model. Um, and uh, the picture that you can see here, this just kind of illustrates some of the differences between um, approaches to uh, environmentalism and, and the environment, kind of a Western approach oftentimes becomes a dualistic approach of, uh, uh, of society, uh, humanity versus nature, whereas in many indigenous cultures, it's more of an interweaving of the two uh, people as a part of nature versus not, not uh, standing as opposed to nature. So just different conceptions of nature in the natural world. Um, and then also talk about post-colonial theory and decolonization, post-colonial theory uh, arising a little bit earlier and kind of a reaction to the crisis within the discipline in the, in the 70s, where essentially anthropologists started to realize some of the uh, destructive um, aspects of, of their work and how it had contributed to colonialism and people that were studied by anthropologists started to really um, rebel against uh, the people studying them, essentially. And then post-colonialism is kind of reflecting um, back and looking at that, at that colonial action. And then decolonization being um, actively undoing colonial practices in the present and in the past. And this is often led by indigenous people and other groups. Um, the next theoretical lens was uh, participatory action research. So for the participatory part, I really like Arnstein's ladder, uh, citizen participation. And this is uh, uh, was created a long time ago, but I still think it's very relevant. And it just kind of talks about, you know, the ideas of things like participation. Uh, and I think we touched, touched on some of this a little bit earlier today of, um, what do people really mean when they say participation, engagement? And a lot of times these things are just kind of buzzwords. And so this ladder, I think, does a, a good job of separating what does that actually look like? So as you can see, uh, informing, just telling somebody what you're going to do, but you're going to do it either way. 
uh, that's kind of one of the lower levels. And then consultation, Arnstein sees as kind of a tokenistic form of uh, collaboration or engagement versus all the way up at the top is citizen control where the um, community is actually really making the decisions um, for what's gonna happen. And then the next uh, lens is adaptive co-management. Um, for this, the adaptive piece focuses on essentially that nature is not always gonna respond to the same stimuli in the same way and return to some sort of balance or equilibrium. We can respond in new and unknown ways to um, newly introduced stimuli. And so an adaptive co-management model um, in the ideal sense focuses on partnering with, in this case, indigenous peoples due to their resiliency in navigating a changing landscape over time and being able to uh, thrive during, uh, throughout those different changes. And then the co-management piece again refers back to uh, Arnstein's letter. Oh, and for, sorry, I skipped part of the action research. So that's the participatory part of participatory action research. And then the other part is um, action research, just like applied research, applied anthropology, pragmatic, practical, looking for results for communities. It focuses on things like democratization, uh, decolonization, liberation, and sort of an iterative cycle of looking, thinking, uh, and taking action and then reflecting on that action. Um, and it values community leadership. Okay, so uh, next I'm gonna get into some of the travel perspectives from my research. So I gotta get to another screen here. Let me see, we got to stop sharing to do this. Can you see the diagram? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is kind of some of the stuff that we um, took a look at in the research. And uh, you know, the main purpose of the research was to identify sites on the landscape. And so a lot of the research was around things like that, just you know, specific sites of concern, specific uses for different places on the landscape. Um, and then another thing that was that was brought up frequently was kind of development in the environment some of the negative impacts of uh, previous development projects were things that um, uh, travel representatives discussed. Um, and uh, also the fact that the cumulative effects of development often were not taken into uh, account. Projects are kind of just looked at on a specific project by project basis. And there's not a lot of thought put into if 10 projects go into this area, what's the overall cumulative impact? Um, and then uh, I'm not gonna go through all these because we don't have time, but uh, in the trust and disclosure uh, theme group, there were a lot of uh, discussion about sort of mistrust of the federal government um, due to a lot of the past colonial actions of the government and, and also present actions. Um, and there was discussion of uh, the legal and political arena. So basically, Travis being apprehensive about divulging information or coming to any agreements with, um, you know, staff on the ground at, at the Bureau of Land Management, uh, because they understood that those decisions could be overturned by those higher up in government uh, or those with more political power. So, um, and then also discussions of only disclosing information when it's necessary. Uh, to protect an area and not really necessarily wanting to just talk about things just to have it out there. Um, and then we get down to barriers to collaboration and mutual understanding. Um, one of, and I used uh, Kathleen uh, Pickering, Pickering's book on this to, to identify a lot of the barriers of different areas. A big one that travel representatives discussed was um, spatial and temporal boundaries, just different conceptions of what uh, what a place is. You know, Western thought uh, sometimes likes to carve um, areas up in, into different, um, easily packaged and managed 
locales, uh, but in uh, indigenous conceptions, sometimes it could be not just a particular site like that, the medicine wheel that was on the first slide, it could be that medicine wheel and its connection to the surrounding landscape. So just a lot of barriers around those different conceptions of what makes up a place uh, with things that came up. And then, uh, you know, a big one was just the tribal input is not sufficiently incorporated into uh, resource management was something that, that came up uh, throughout our conversations. Um, then as far as participation and engagement, a big one there was just the need for um, increased federal participation in the process. The BLM only participated in one of the um, site visits for this project. And that was kind of an indicator to some of the representatives that maybe this project wasn't too much of a priority for them. Um, and then another big one here was the importance of feeling or experiencing traditional cultural properties. So um, in many instances, people at the BLM or other agencies making decisions, important decisions that affect these places don't actually ever go out and uh, feel or experience those places themselves. So that was something that tribal representatives brought up uh, as being really important. And then um, uh, in this tribal knowledge and way of, ways of knowing, a lot of this was just coding um, tribal expertise and expertise in a way that somebody that's an archeologist uh, or an anthropologist coming in and just looking at these um, places themselves wouldn't, wouldn't be able to discern without uh, that tribal knowledge. So just valuing that tribal knowledge. Uh, and then also in here, uh, one that I think is important is the recognition of traditional uh, names of places. And this get back, gets back to um, kind of like the Sapir Wharf hypothesis and, and how you talk about a place or how you, you speak about a place interacts uh, your uh, influences your experience of that place. Um, and then these all kind of filter down into tribal resource management recommendations. So uh, a lot of these had to do with direct tribal involvement in survey, survey and resource management, um, meaning tribal members actually going out and looking at the places uh, alongside archeologists or before instead of archeologists uh, going out and, and looking at these places on the landscape. Uh, another big one that came up was just the need for regular meetings. Uh, when these sorts of studies happen in an ad hoc basis, there's so many projects across the United States that could be difficult for um, tribal representatives to give sufficient um, energy and focus to, to each of the projects. Uh, whereas if they're all Kind of discussed at one time at regular intervals it's, it's a lot easier to plan so that was that was one thing that some of the tribal representatives mentioned all right i'm going to go back to the presentation now um one sec okay can you see the presentation again yeah um so and again, I'm not going to go through all these because there's not time, but I'm just going to touch on a few of them. Uh, and this kind of goes into that, again, shifting time, shifting roles, sorts of things. Uh, number five here is archaeologists and tribal relations. A lot of the people at the company were archaeologists, not um, cultural, applied cultural anthropologists. Um, and many archaeologists are now in private consulting instead of, uh, instead of academia. And archaeologists, in many ways, have kind of become de facto tribal uh, liaisons and experts on tribal resources. Uh, and this has resulted in a lot of uh, adversarial um, relationships in the past due to essentially things like archaeologists saying, uh, you know, this is this site doesn't relate to your culture or something like that based on, on their methods versus uh, maybe a way a tribe is thinking about a particular place. Um, and, uh, but the, the relationship is changing and, and uh, improving in some ways. Tribes are gaining more experience and becoming more versed in archeology span and cultural anthropology themselves. And also 
just getting a, a bigger seat at the table in terms of these types of conversations. Um, and archaeologists in turn are kind of gaining a better understanding of travel perspectives over time. Um, so one quote from uh, one of the people that, um, so in addition to uh, the research I, I talked about before, I did some more like actually recorded uh, interviews with some uh, federal uh, agency representatives and some of the consultant representatives and so forth. Um, and so this is one of the quotes, converting ignorance into understanding and understanding its respect. There's things you'll never be able to fully feel or understand, but if you can come to some terms with them, then I think that in practice, more people are willing to work with tribes to preserve what's important to them. If nothing else, they recognize that these things are important to tribes and are willing to respect and move forward with those preservations, whether or not they fit into the old section 106 rules or not. Um, so yeah, that quote just kind of talks about how um, the frame of at least some archaeologists is changing in terms of how they how they're relating to tribes. Um, and then uh, some other interesting things that came out were just looking at the uh, number seven, looking at the order of events and uh, disconnection of indigenous people from the landscape. Um, basically, through the research, everyone agreed that bringing tribes into the process earlier was important. Sometimes tribes are not brought in until uh, you know decisions for the site are mostly already made. Uh, and um, there's uh, limited influence that, that tribal tribes are able to have through that consultation. So many people agreed that bringing tribes into the process earlier uh, was an important aspect. And uh, um, it, one of the issues is that archaeologists are, are sometimes approved to survey the landscape before anything else happens really and then the project ends up building momentum and uh, tribes you know don't get a chance to they kind of just have to take the archaeologist's word for it that yes this these are all the things on the landscape and um, you know they, they don't get to really review that information themselves um, but uh, you know and then the other thing is that tribes are kind of asked or just told to say like well, tell us everything that you know that is here on the landscape. And that's really not a fair standard for a number of reasons. One is it's not, it's not fair to assume that um, you know, all tribal members necessarily know everything uh, related to their culture that's out there on the landscape. And if you think about comparisons to any other culture, that's not a fair standard to have, even that um, tribal elders or tribal experts are gonna necessarily know that, um, especially due to the you know, actions of the government, uh, relocation and forced disconnection from the landscape that many uh, tribes have endured. Um, the, the process of, of um, surveying the landscape can be a process of reconnection uh, for tribal um, members, representatives that may have been disconnected from those areas. Um, so just kind of changing the perceptions of, of when tribal input should be um, valued there. And then another thing that came out was around the uh, prioritization of nature versus sacred or culturally important sites. Um, this was a quote from, from one of the people I interviewed talking about kind of the ways that the laws around protection, protecting traditional cultural properties uh, are not uh, strong enough to really protect those places. So talking about the San Francisco Peaks, one interviewee said, you can't protect it as a TCP, but you can protect it under the Endangered Species Act because of the nitrogen that was being added to the mountain, which was reducing habitat for protected species. So this is a situation where you can use legislation that is guided to protect plants, to protect things that legislation designed to protect people and their concerns isn't strong enough for it. That kind of makes you reflect on the values we assign this whole TCP thing. If a plant has more sway than the people, it makes you wonder if that's the right, if the TCP language is, is the way, right way of managing it and, and has enough power behind it, or if it's just kind of like acknowledging that there's a concern but not really doing a whole lot about it. Um, 
let's see, I have a few more here. Uh, one that I, I thought was important to, let me see how much time I'm at. Ah, it's already 2.30, okay. <laughs> um, one that I think that's important for this conference is, is looking at just kind of the role of eth ethnography and tribal relations. And, you know, this project was an opportunity to reflect on that. Um, in, in many cases, these projects go to an elite group of archaeologists and cultural anthropologists. Um, and the other thing that came out is essentially tribes have the capacity to, to be their own ethnographers and do these projects themselves in many cases. So it just kind of brings up the issue of what exactly is the role of the anthropologist or the uh, ethnographer. Um, in these types of projects, are they acting as a filter that doesn't necessarily need to be there in some cases? Um, so that's an important question, I think. Um, but then the other thing is about what I said before about kind of archeologists becoming the de facto point person in these types of projects. And uh, I think it's important that cultural anthropology and applied anthropologists that aren't archeologists really um, make sure that we're digging in and getting involved in this type of work. I think it's it's difficult uh, work because it's it can be kind of messy and, uh, you know, ethically hard to navigate, I guess, um, but kind of just not engaging in it, um, you know, means that others are, I, I think this is an area where, where anthropologists could add value. Um, so I think it's important that we continue to do that. Uh, all right, I'm just gonna do a couple more to wrap up. So um, a big thing, and this relates back to when I was talking about DAPL earlier, is the business case for meaningful consultation. And as that case proves, uh, you know, it, it can be advantageous for, um, it's, I think it's important to make the business case to uh, industry and energy developers, whoever it is, uh, that it is in their best interest to engage in tribal consultation uh, because of their own self-interest. Uh, and while there's not always an opportunity for win-win scenario between developers and tribes, um, it is in the best interest of developers to involve tribes. Uh, and a way to frame it is just lowering their risk, essentially. Uh, also for financiers, aversion to risk among financiers and developers, along with thoughts about co corporate social responsibility can encourage more of these types of studies to be um, done in the future. So consultants, uh, like the consultant that I was working for, they can have a substantial impact uh, on projects and the damage that they do to natural and cultural resources. But anything that they do is limited. It must be essentially a win-win for their client and and uh, and tribes. So you know they can't say if they were a consultant on DAPL or whatever, they couldn't be like, well, don't build DAPL because the the client isn't gonna it's not gonna change anything. They'll just fire that consultant and hire another consultant. But they could, for instance, through doing this type of study, say, hey, you really shouldn't build it right here. That's gonna cause you a lot of problems. We suggest going over here. So things like that. Um, and then uh, the next one is on the ethics of harm reduction consultation. Uh, so tribal consultation ultimately results in projects moving forward. Uh, wholesale opposition development in many cases is not effective and projects move forward regardless. Therefore, there's an ethical responsibility to ensure that projects that do more move forward do so, do so in the least damaging way possible. Um, both work inside and outside the system will lead to a more sustainable future. Uh, and tribal consultation is also needed, not just for things like oil and gas, mining, uh, those types of extractive development projects, but also things like solar, uh, wind, uh, any sort of large scale development, it's important that this consultation be taking place and be taking place effectively. Um, so current trends and new models uh, that came up as part of this research is essentially just allowing tribes to speak for themselves rather than necessarily filtering what they have to say through an archeologist or an anthropologist. Um, 
federal governments and other agents uh, entities engaging with tribes, not just when there's a legal requirement to do so, but just forming those relationships uh, outside of a government to government consultation. And um, another one was having tribes deploy their own survey surveyors alongside archaeologists and having two surveys be done for different purposes, the archaeological survey um, for kind of scientific uh, purposes, archaeological purposes, and then a tribal survey of things, uh, essentially a survey of what's valuable and important to tribes. Um, so that's something that's been done in a few cases and, and been successful and, and is becoming increasingly more common. Um, and uh, another one is just not kind of limiting a lot of times these discussions around tribal engagement are limited to thinking about um, just cultural or what's deemed as cultural or archeological when really, um, and that goes back to the theoretical lens of traditional ecological knowledge. In many cases for tribes, uh, there's, no, there's not necessarily a distinction between what's a cultural resource versus what's a natural resource. They're one and the same thing in many instances. So just increased recognition uh, that tribes need to be involved in both discussions of natural resources just because they're natural resources and involved in discussions of natural resources because natural resources are also cultural resources for tribes in many uh, instances. Uh, and then finally, working with resources as kind of an economic development opportunity. Uh, in many cases, uh, tribes are alienated from the economic benefits of uh, working with these resources. It's a large industry, both cultural resources consulting and environmental consulting um, is a large industry that heavily involves working with tribes, but tribes don't necessarily see a lot of the um, economic benefits of uh, working with their own resources uh, through this type of um, consultation and engagement with the resources. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna run out of time. So I don't know what else I'm gonna cover here. So yeah, essentially my my recommendations of involve, um, you know, more of a participatory action framework an adaptive co-management framework instead of uh, kind of an outdated, um, old school ethnographic uh, approach to, to these types of projects and to tribal consultation generally. I think I'm gonna end it there because I'm gonna run out of time, so. Any questions? All right. Thank you, Max, for a very thought-provoking conversation. Obviously, if you didn't notice, we were going crazy in the chat <laughs> boxes here. So uh, obviously, we, had a, we all had a lot of things to say. So wonderful job, Max. All right, we have a few minutes for questions. So uh, go ahead and uh, ask your questions. I guess I had one thing that kind of came to mind when you were talking about you know, that expectation for tribal members to not only be experts on kind of all of the ecological life, but there's also that question of, is it safe to share that with every researcher or government contractor that comes in? Like, you know, you might know, but maybe you shouldn't say. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, what's the benefit necessarily of, uh, you know, especially are we going to change what we're, or is not us, but is the BLM going to change what they're doing based on that information, or is that just putting more information out there that doesn't need to be out there? Yeah. And there were there were the like really stark examples of that where like sites were bulldozed ahead of the courts being able to kind of like respond to the declaration of the sites concerning the dapple stuff for you know like I don't know I think that's just what popped into my mind. <clears throat> yeah, and that's ethnocide. That's the willful destruction of someone else's culture. You know, it's it's very problematic. I was just saying like this idea of information being justified by like all information or all progress being just like the means is always justified by the fact that you have the information like 
this is the same thing we see in like NAGPRA arguments, arguments against NAGPRA. While we need the, the, the information is more valuable than the relationships with people and with like our ancestors and with our families and things like that. And just the way that gets talked about too, like we'll talk about it like this uniquely indigenous thing. And if you think about global indigenous, it probably is, but we don't talk about it with regards to like Greek archeology span that much, or these sort of <clears throat> sites where there is just as much of a discomfort against disruption of that landscape. Um, but it's just, it's framed as this indigenous problem a lot of the time. And there are these opportunities to see those parallels outside of it too. I just really appreciated this idea of like collaborative, we were talking about like collaborative ethnographies with the land and things like that and the way that storytelling happens. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in with your work and to kind of try to apply it to and reasons I wanna read everyone's thesis is um, visual markers in the landscape is something my uh, mom and I are gonna maybe look at for a project, but like what are, and we talked about this during the break a little bit, like what are the visual markers in the landscape that remind you who you are and like what your role is in that landscape? Like what is your role in, in community with the landscape and community with the people that you're talking to and their relationship with the landscape? Like how can the landscape itself remind you of your place? But I don't know, I just really, I wanna see what the guide for consultants would look like and what it would look like for specific tribes and specific cultures versus like Indian country in general, like the things we have to consider about the ways things have been approached in the past, like you're talking about, Max. Yeah, yeah there's definitely a lot of work still to do to kind of develop that, develop a better guide and hopefully some of the stuff in the thesis is a start, but I feel like I didn't even, half the things I talked about in the thesis, I didn't even do, it was it was really hard to actually do those, especially in the context of working for a consultant who's working for the BLM, who's talking to the tribes. I was like three degrees removed from anything going on and it, it was very hard to, you know, I can write it down on paper, but it, it's it's difficult to do effectively. Well, no one wants to pay for it, right? Because doing all these additional stuff takes time and money. And especially when you're talking about a for-profit company, the motivation is not, it's not to adequately address the needs of all participants in the study. It's to check the box to make sure we don't get sued. That's, that's a very different kind of motivational tool, right? Which at least we have that, which we didn't used to have, but so it's a, like a step in the right direction, but it's not even close to what needs to happen. I'd like to bring up uh, just a side issue and, and Max mentioned this and I appreciated his kind of pulling it out, teasing it out. And that is, um, I've been listening here in Colorado and a couple of other parts of the world, the euphemisms, uh, the word energy, uh, the energy industry, and I appreciated when Max was mentioning the oil and gas um, and also include coal extraction um, and what that does to the land and, and the purpose of what oil, gas and coal is about rather than just energy, as well as mention uh, what sort of space land development issues go along with both wind and solar because they take up space, time, things as well, money, people, they have an impact as well on the people and, and the land. But again, this, this issue I have about um, uh, just including the, the oil and gas and uh, coal companies in this nice easy word calling the energy uh, industry. And um, it, it sure makes things, uh, it's like the sugar makes the medicine go down a lot easier. Um, and, and so at any rate, that's, Given that what we're dealing with, that's just one of those little words that I, I keep wanting to uh, help people maybe consider if it's appropriate at the time, use the term oil and gas and coal or whatever the topic is, rather than just kind of say the nice euphemistic word energy and uh, like we see on our advertisements on TV and the, it just slides right by and everybody gets so used to it and it feels like a good thing and um, and nobody really knows what the hell energy really is. They just, if they flip on the light switch, it better go on. So um, anyway, that's my two cents.
It's like that disconnect we were talking about with food production earlier, right? We have this disconnect from energy production. So much of our culture is disconnected from the the production cycle, from who is actually doing the tasks and chores and, and creating the new spheres of information and all that stuff. And we just consume uh, and we don't think about that. We don't understand the costs of all these things. We put stickers on the products sometimes, like certain companies put stickers on the products with like the face of the person who made it for you, which is just another kind of like weird propaganda head game at this point. Like, so it's like, what what is the difference between genuine progress and the facsimile of progress? If the effects are good, then does it matter? But, you know, I don't know if it can always be free of the storytelling aspect of that and the sort of like reframing of the thing. I think that's a, a lot of what I got out of this, Max, was this idea of reframing um, and how you're framing it and like what your approach is being really, really important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, yeah, and it, I think it's, it's just, it's difficult. I, I mean, it was hard for me to engage in this subject. I think it's just, um, you know, yeah, because it's just so ethically messy and it's, and it's, uh, you know, yeah, what terms I started saying, I start saying things the way people I'm working with start saying them, which is like, say, energy. And then I started saying energy instead of, like you were saying, Ted, just saying <laughs> oil, gas, you know, because energy sounds more politically correct. Of course, that's... That's what a lot of people I was working with say. So yeah, it, it is just, uh, it, it messes with you a little bit just trying to navigate all of it. But I think it's important because just kind of, you know, oh, this is too difficult to engage in. So we're just going to ignore it and say, and wash our hands of it doesn't um, result in the best outcomes. So, yeah. All right. Any final thoughts or questions? Mm. Nothing is final. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Definitely not in this field. Yeah, yeah, we're going to start stuff, not finalize yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Max, for a wonderful and um, definitely uh, thought provoking presentation. Uh, very much appreciate it. Great job. Thanks.